Um, I came in here mainly to talk to people and answer questions. So if you'd like to ask me anything, it doesn't have to be about the speech, anything about Green Party policy, what we are doing, what we should be doing, tell me what we should be doing. Go ahead. Any, would anyone like to make a comment or ask a question? Yes. How is the Green Party proposed to renationalise industries like the railways and energy? If they do, I know they're proposed to renationalise railways. And, and all yeah. utilities, yes. Well, um, the strategy for renationalising the railways is incredibly easy. We've already renationalised the East Coast Rail line because private industry couldn't make profit out of it, so they gave up and gave it back. And as, as the contracts come up for each of the rail lines, we just take them over nationally and run them nationally. Um, that, that's the simple one. Um, energy production is much more difficult and, and we're not necessarily talking about nationalising energy production but um, having it owned by the people. That can be in some cases nationalised but we believe that things like community wind farms and smaller levels of production locally are the way forward and we should be encouraging people to set, set these up. We've had so many farmers, rich farmers, say, I want to build five wind turbines on my land. I will get millions and millions of pounds in income from it and everyone else can suffer it. If, if people, and it's happened in a few places, people in the local neighbourhood have said, have been told, well, anyone who can see these from their homes will get a share of the income. They suddenly become incredibly popular. <laughs> and they've happened, they've happened um, we were up in, um, what's it Gate said, what's it up, up, up the north, northeast, I can't remember where it was, where one, one of the um, car manufacturing companies, some of them, thank you, <laughs> As, I knew it was up there somewhere. <laughs> Vicky's from that area, she knows it much better than I do. One of the car companies has put up two wind turbines and they're not keeping profits, they're distributing the profits to the local area. And even though it's in a relatively built up area, people are very, very happy living within 100 metres or so of them because they're seeing the benefit, they're not going to, to big companies. And when, when you talk about methane digesters, small level methane digesters in local areas are great. And, but one thing we can do to, to in, make it go faster, nationalisation go faster, is tax tax these people's profits at a level that makes it unpleasant for them to carry on. And we can do it that way. What I would have liked the Labour Party to have done when these companies were nationalised in the first place was say, when we get to power, we will buy back those shares at exactly the amount you paid for them. <laughs> Had the Labour Party done that, Maggie Thatcher would never have got away with selling them off in the first place. And that's something I think we, we need to be doing. So it, it, it would be more gradual, but the railways are very, very easy to do straight away. Another question? Well, I'd like to comment on what you've said. Um, you seem to think the railway situation is a lot more simple than it is. Um, yes, you can renationalise the train operating companies when the franchises come up. And yes, the infrastructure, which you haven't mentioned, is already nationalised in a sort of backdoor kind of way. Yeah. But the rest of the railway is, well, there were over 200 bits of it when the Big Bang happened, and other big bits have gone before that. And uh, how are you going to repossess all the engineering functions, for example? Uh, you'll never get back the warehouses and goods stations because they were dismantled when national carriers took over. You could bring back the shipping services and the through services, the through bookings for them. But that would be difficult because they belong to foreign companies now. The hotels have gone, even though they're integral with the stations in a lot of places. But it, it's the engineering functions that are the big 
trimmed now, I think, because we lost all wagon road traffic, let's say, when the goods stations went to national carriers, and we're never going to get that back. So we lost the marshalling yards got closed after that because there was no traffic for them. Uh, so we've, all that's gone on the roads. Yes, yes. So and and we, we can't, we can't from, very well do much about that. But uh, the idea that just taking back the train operating companies is going to be the big thing, when it's the case of children, it'll be a bad thing because that's one of the few that's run properly by ex railwaymen. Um, uh, m m most of them it would be a good thing, but it wouldn't be such a big thing as you seem to think. No, I, I, I don't think that would be a very big thing. I think that would be a very easy thing to do as a first step. Comparatively easy, yes. yes. Yeah. I mean, East Coast has done quite well under nationalisation, but not as well as it did under GNER, who got thrown off the contract for, for financial reasons. But they were, in fact, making a better job of running the trains than the East Coast um, nationalised, who in turn are a lot better than most of the other yeah. franchises. John, I think we're yeah. getting a bit bogged down. There are two yes. hands up at the back. Yeah. Who would you like to take next? Yeah. Yeah. Lewis has actually written a letter asking for a citizens' constitutional convention to renegotiate and discuss our constitutional settlement in this country. We want democracy, we want proper democracy, not a democracy that excludes people, which is what we currently have. <laughs> There's a difference between saying and doing. And we, we've always stood for actually having decision making as close to the big group effects as possible. But subsidiarity in its truest sense. And that's a principle we continue to hold. Which is why we supported the independence of Scotland. There was someone near the middle. Yeah. yeah. So would there be a support for saying? Um, very possibly, but I think actually breaking it down to actually giving smaller regions more power is more important than, than, than the English Parliament. Because at the moment, there's, um, England is more divided internally than England to Scotland. I mean, the, the, the powerhouse financial and personnel wise that is London is distorting everything. We need to actually get that sorted out before. Anybody who lives within an hour and a half's journey of London finds they, their rents are over a thousand pounds a week, let alone a month, because it's getting worse the more we rely on that place. Yeah. One of the problems, it seems to me, is there's a stranglehold of local authorities. Central government determines or dictates what kind of increase in local authorities can make in Britain and, and, and the rates and so on. Um, um, rather than having an, an English Parliament, it seems to me to, to be able to give much greater independence to local authorities with strict national guidelines about the kind of standards of services that need to be provided. Because I can imagine, you know, some of the Tory shires, like our own, <laughs> uh, you know, they, they, they are an attempt to uh, to keep rates down and to reduce services. So national standards could be set. But we, an English Parliament doesn't seem to be relevant. Yeah, I, yeah, I think I think that's fair. It, it is that power has been taken away from local councils, as all the councils will will know over the last few years to an extent, whereby we can do virtually nothing other than fulfil statutory guidelines and it's getting more and more difficult to do that in a lot of areas. And we've got to do something about bringing power to the regions and to local councils, absolutely certainly. Yeah? Jim, that sort of that, there's a combination of these two aspects. Is, is talk about privatisation, I don't think one of the biggest threats is not so much the privatisation of utilities and industries, but privatisation of government. Yes. Of, 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 of civil society, which needs to be 
usually blurs and, and actually that these functions are put back in the hands of both the civil and the public services. Yeah. And that needs to be done. And that should be done coupling with, as we've been talking about, decentralisation of, of power and decision making. Uh, absolutely. And one of the huge, huge problems is Farrar says about bringing power back to the to the people of the country. Power at the moment actually resides with big corporations and their lobbyists, not with people who vote. Who is someone at the back? Yes. Yeah. You um, mentioned growth. Ah. Oh. <coughs> oh. No. The idea of continuing growth. It seems unsustainable to me. No, I, I didn't say we wanted growth. I said when we had growth, a third of it was from the green economy. Oh, right. uh, we certainly oh, don't. No, certainly don't want you to think I or anyone in the Green Party is in favour of growth. We don't think that the increase in, as I actually said in the speech, that an increase in GDP year on year, which is the definition of growth, does not mean that people are getting a better deal, that people are happier, that people have a better standard of living. As I pointed out um, on many occasions, um, if you crash your car and have to buy a new one, you're contributing really positively to economic growth. If you grow your own rhubarb and give your friends some, you are actually reducing economic growth. So it's a nonsense. Yeah, it was, yeah. How do you think the Green Party could perhaps have a bigger presence in, in England or the UK? Because Generally, I, I said to my colleagues, I was coming to a, a Green Party meeting, and, and they said, what's the Green Party? <gasps> um, <laughs> it's, it's huge. And, and if you can answer that question, would you mind have, a, have an answer to everything? Um, the, the, problem, the problem is the media, um, because, and big business, as we're against the media having more power than it's already got and having as much power as it has, they don't like us. And big businesses don't like us either because we don't want them to carry on making huge profits. It is a great problem. But, having said that, the amount the party has grown, people are hearing more and more about us. We have grown by 50% since I was, became deputy leader. We are growing massively. This year's conference was the biggest national conference the Green Party's ever had. 40% of the people who attended that conference were there for the first time. It got more media coverage in the West Midlands and nationally than we've ever had. And a lot of this is because we have been pressurising the media, we've been pressurising the BBC, which was a huge campaign. And when it was proved that we actually got more votes per minute of airtime than any other national, <laughs> national party, um, the BBC began to realise, well, maybe we ought to be talking to them and listening more. So we are getting much, much more coverage than we used to. And we are now reaching the stage, two years on, where Caroline Lucas isn't the only person in anyone's ever heard of from the Green Party. So uh, we are making progress, but it's, it's, it's like wading through treacle at the moment. But our time will come, and it is gradually coming, I think. And it's not a continuous thing. We will. Yeah. What do those percentage figures that you mentioned equate to in numbers, say, to 50% bigger than... Um, we are now at 18 and a half then is not huge compared to certain to UKIP or Labour or any of the others, um, but it's a lot more than we, we have been recently. But Labour and Tory membership is going down. Yes, yes, yes absolutely, yeah. And, and, and the Lib Dems plummeting all three of them, where we are on a, a steady, sustainable growth. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, I just wanted to ask you about the, the maths essentially. You, you've set up a really um, comprehensive kind of outline of what a different kind of economy would look like. My fear is that lots of people in other parties would come and say, oh, yes, but the maths doesn't add up. Is there some way?
very kind of easy and accessible where we can say, so look, here are, here are some, you know, people with some economic now, some knowledge and understanding, you've done the maths, it does work, here's the, here's the report, here's the summary that, that, that explains how it works. Yes, thank you for asking that question. Can you repeat the question? Yes, I can repeat the question. Um, the question was essentially, is, is there anywhere um, clear where the maths behind this new vision of the economy is, uh, is set out? Um, as a mathematician by trade, <laughs> this is important. If you, if you actually can get hold, and I think it's still online, of a copy of the 2010 General Election Manifesto, all of our policies in there were thoroughly costed. Channel 4 ran a documentary program. They spent three months investigating line by line the economics of the justification in, it was an appendix at the back of that manifesto. You won't have seen the programme because it never went out because they couldn't find anything that didn't add up. The next manifesto for the coming general election, we have decided, and I pressurised them, will also be fully costed. There will be an appendix where all of the figures are there and they will all add up and it will be checked by economists and mathematicians because we are expecting Channel 4 to try and do likewise. And it, it's, it was so frustrating after we cooperated with them on producing this to say how, how it would work and how we didn't need austerity, we didn't need cuts to services. They didn't put it forward because it didn't prove what they wanted to prove in the first place. Absolutely disgraceful problem we have with the media. But we will do it again and you will be able to refer to that manifesto which is the, the previous one where the figures are there for what we would have done and there's new figures in the new manifesto as well. So um, if, for example, economic conditions were made less attractive for multinationals, you know, because um, they were going to be more squeezed on tax evasion or yes. tax, tax corporation tax would be increased, that sort of thing, um, would, how, the Green, how, how does the Green Party answer arguments that, that they would simply move their enterprises elsewhere and that there would be an increase in unemployment in this country? Um, well, the, the, the fight of the businesses has got nothing to do with unemployment because we're talking about two people to run the head office of a, a business. Uh, when the Scottish companies were talking about moving their yes. headquarters down south, it's not the workers in it, it's just a couple of people to pick up the, well, sure, pick up the post for their headquarters. There head are office. still but some enterprises that do employ ordinary people. Yeah, yes, but they would, sit there, they would still employ the people where they are. I mean, okay. why not? I see. Yeah, yes, it, 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 it. You can't move a factory as easily as you can move no. an office. Yeah. Oh, you, so they would you, move you an office in order, to, in order to pay a lower tax, but they would still employ the people in this country. Yes, yes. And like, like Starbucks, if they are not mm. paying, they're still, they're still they in the coffee shops in the box with the lights. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, the, the idea is we actually do a form of taxation where they pay the tax on the money in the country where it's paid mm. rather than it all being done through head office. Now this needs some EU rule change, but we yes. want to change EU yes. rules anyway. Mm. But it, it is possible, it's, it's difficult um, to make sure it happens, but at the moment the, the current race to the bottom to the, to, for countries saying, oh, We'll, we'll reduce our corporation tax to 25%. Oh, we'll go 21%. Oh, we'll go 20%. It's, it's absolute nonsense. And we, we can stop it. We've got to stop it in agreement with, with other countries. And we can do it by taxing the money where it's spent yeah. instead of where the head office is. And we, I'll, I'll answer a different question as well, because we'll, <laughs> they often go together. What about the rich people if we start taxing them? Oh, yes. A lot the, these rich bankers who bring such a lot of money into into this country, which they do in way of taxation, they do bring in a lot of money into this country. 
But only because they took it out in the first place. When the, when the, the money, money makers in the city buy commodities at one price and sell them at another and make a huge profit, they're doing one of two things or both. They're reducing the amount the producer gets for their commodities or they're increasing the price the consumer pays. So if they go, that differential in price will go with them. So let them go. <laughs> that wasn't a direct answer to that question, but it goes hand in hand, doesn't it? Yeah? Following on from that discussion, <clears throat> there's an awful lot that would be we're talking about, and, and not liking big businesses, we're talking about multinational corporations who are paying minimum wage, are riding roughshod over the people they're supposed to be helping, and destroying smaller local businesses. It's quite a nebulous definition, isn't it? <laughs> um, BP, Shell, Tesco, Walmart, like tax avoidance, tax evasion, having your headquarters in Liechtenstein or Jersey so you don't have to pay UK tax. Those are the poor business practices we need to clamp down on. Yeah. The yeah, other, so, so therefore, they need to pay proper corporation yeah. tax on whatever profits they're making at whatever level. So we should be start targeting practices rather than the businesses. Mm. We need to be careful to say, I think the point is that the bigger the business, the easier it is for them to engage in these kinds of business practices. Small, I mean, if you said yourself, SME, there is a classic economic definition of a small and medium enterprise. There is a classic economic definition of a small business, yeah? These businesses generally don't have the resources to have a headquarters in Liechtenstein. They generally pay their taxes. It tends to be the bigger businesses who employ accountants like KMPG and, and the rest of the other, I'm not supposed to say bastards, am I? Um, <laughs> who, the big four, thank you, Chris. <laughs> who are well versed in all the legal loopholes in the tax system. And those are the kinds of things we want to crack down on, and those are the kinds of things we can generally done by the bigger businesses. Does that make sense? Sort of makes sense. All big businesses for small businesses won't. So there is, you know, there's a transition period there. Mm. Ash, I, I totally agree with the whole idea of you know focusing on avoiding, you know, stopping tax evasion and, and producing, putting, putting some business legislation in to stop mm. those loopholes. But I think to be sort of generally saying we're going to go after business. Per se, and once mm -hmm. you, you transit, you, you, you make this transition from being a small and medium business to a large business, you're a bad thing. I think you need to be putting in, you know, focusing on, on, ways on the behaviours rather than the size of the business. Take a point, yes. And of course, there we go, feed yeah, back to the yeah, National of Party. Of course, there are, there are big, big businesses like John Lewis and, and um, co yeah. that we approve of a lot of their practices and, mm -hmm. and 
we try and talk about big business corporations um, as a shorthand for the, the big businesses who are doing the things we are trying to stop. And it's the actions that they're taking that we're trying to stop rather than any businesses being big. farming um, workshop that just happened, it was, po it was pointed out that at the moment we produce enough food to feed 14 billion people, twice the current population of the earth, is what we currently produce in food. Uh, so the, the amount of people is really a secondary concern and, and as societies become more as they become richer, and there are there are now half the countries in the world with a declining population. Well, uh, just now, food production, though, the, you know, the environmental challenges are you know, diverse. And but, but when you you've got um, one percent of the population of the Earth producing more greenhouse gases than the other ninety nine percent. And we population in the end will make a difference, but it's the, the things we can tackle and tackle sensibly are the distribution and the use of the resources we've got. Um, the, the poor people in Africa aren't using the carbon and the, the earth's deposits. We need to tackle the people who are using them, not talk about how many people there are. I think it's. It has been used as a red herring to justify a lot of things in the past and, and as a red herring to stop us concentrating on doing what we need to actually do in terms of, of ensuring that the, the richest countries in the world stop using up all three planets worth of resources. ensuring that we don't get a lot of people moving from one country to the other is to actually make sure the Earth's resources are spread a little there. We are very, very upset with a lot of the aid that's happening where, where we give money to other governments who then use it to buy the weapons that we're making by the unsustainable technologies we're using and by GM crops that they're going to have to buy again next year. We, we believe we, we need a huge aid program to various parts of the world. We need to make sure that the world's resources are distributed more fairly. We need to stop taking and taking from, from other poor countries and just giving them a pittance for, for what we take out of there, there, instead of actually paying them what it's worth, and taking uranium and copper from other countries and, and paying them peanuts because we know they'll accept it. So, if so we're. What sort of percentage of GDP? 1%. 1%. Are we at 0.7 at the moment? Uh, we Getting did get to 0.7 yeah. at one point. I'm not sure what it is now. Cameron said he'd keep the yeah. target, so it's. Yeah. Point seven, I believe, is the UN stipulation, yes. but the Green Party policy is one percent yeah. in the short term. Yeah. Okay. Um, also, on that, um, with sort of 
and European agricultural policy. Um, so I watch you make that. <laughs> we, we obviously subsidise our agriculture very heavily through the European Union. And um, with this sort of European Union policy of everything but arms, um, sort of treaty with Africa and places like that, would it not um, sort of reducing our agricultural policy that help to support Africa so they could grow my agriculture to export to Europe, but also so they could produce my agriculture? Themselves. Yeah, so um, if you see what I'm yeah but the aim would really be for them to actually start producing food for their own people first, yeah. rather than producing cash crops to export towards that, and that's the sustainable way to go, and that's what we really need, need to be looking at. And um, uh, Yes, we definitely do need to change the agricultural policy in Europe. It, 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 it is silly that we we exclude and penalise other people, and then and then give them a, give them aid. It doesn't make sense, and yet we need to totally scrap the food policy and make sure that local people in Africa and here can actually eat local food. And there's a plentiful supply. So, sorry, oh, <laughs> you've yeah, yeah. yeah. come back. Yeah, so much for that. Thanks. We talk about the minimum wage of ten pounds an hour.
You see, it's, <laughs> you're proving it's well taught about well known in real politics. <laughs> um, and it's, it, it, is, it is something we need to try and get over. And the problem has been that the, the big neoliberal parties led by UKIP and followed by the other three have been saying exactly the opposite. And it's very, very difficult to get our voice heard. And, and when, when you start trying to explain it, trying to get through to people that it's not actually going to help you survive from the poor and be happier than just to build a gated community and lock yourself in every evening, that, that it is difficult to get people to start thinking and understanding that really are, that people really are happier in a fairer society. Because so many people have been trained and taught that to get happier you get more money. And that's what you need. And of course, with so, so many people coming with parents and grandparents who lived in absolute dreadful poverty, the need for some money to get out of poverty and out of desperate situations was so grand, and still is for a lot of people, that, that they don't realise, and it takes an awful lot of persuading and explaining to get people to realise that once you've got a certain income, more income doesn't make you more satisfied and happier. You need a certain level of income to stop being dissatisfied and hungry and desperate, but it's not a continuum continuity, you don't get more happiness with more income. And it is, it is difficult, but I think most Green Party people understand it and know it and talk about it amongst themselves, but it's very difficult to get across. Yeah? Example of what we're talking about, and it's, it's been proved to be true throughout the world. In fact, there's a new Danny Donnelly book about to come out, or has come out, which actually goes through all the arguments, all the reasons why a more equal society is happier. So it's worth having a look at. I try and explain it, try and promote it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you very much for some very interesting questions.